for uh, justice from the Supreme Court. So, um, alors, je, on va commencer tout de suite. Uh, la présentation sera en anglais uh, pour être sûr que tout le monde uh, suive uh, uh, au niveau du panel. Uh, mais merci beaucoup uh, d'être présent aujourd'hui. I would also like to uh, thank uh, all of those who are attending uh, through the webinar. Um, we want to welcome you to this uh, Osler Tax uh, Seminar and Webinar. Uh, first of all, I, I, I do want to thank uh, both Marshall and Al to, uh, because they, they flew to Montreal to be with us uh, today, and I truly appreciate that. Um, as part of the seminar, feel free to ask questions. Uh, it's always nice when we can make this uh, interactive. Um, and for those of us who are joining us through the webinar, uh, for technical reasons and time management reasons, uh, it won't be possible to address your question on the spot. But if, if you do send questions by email, uh, we will respond to them uh, in the coming days. Uh, finally, uh, we will make the presentation available to everyone who attended the seminar. Uh, and the certificates for uh, members of the Quebec Bar will be emailed to you shortly after the event. With that, uh, let me present you uh, our presenters. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, with Marshall. Um, Marshall had a stellar career at the Federal Court Trial Division, Federal Court of Appeal, and finally at, at the Supreme Court of Canada level. He played in a pivotal role in, in a number of major tax cases, and I would mention uh, cases like Coptorn, uh, Lipson, Glaxo, Uh, and OSFC, and there are many others. Thank you, Marshall. Al, what can I say about Al? Uh, Al litigated a number of very important tax cases for the past, I guess I would say, more than, the, more than 20 years. Um, and he, he argued landmark cases uh, going back to Shell Canada, uh, the interest deduction case, a bunch of GAR cases, Uh, Trusco uh, and, and others, a bunch of transfer pricing cases, Glaxo, GE Capital, recently uh, the chemical decision, and, and he also dabbles in GST, uh, and he argued uh, one very uh, important case that he argued is the CIBC world market uh, case. Al, thank you. Finally, uh, let me introduce you to Mark. Uh, Mark, in addition to being a good friend, is the leader of the Montreal Tax Group in Osler, uh, in Montreal. He's also the chair of the Canadian Tax Foundation. Uh, Mark is well known for his expertise in tax planning, but uh, I, I know for a fact, and I even know it more uh, than I did uh, a year ago before I joined uh, Osler, um, Mark is heavily involved uh, in tax controversy cases. And, and he gets involved at every step of the way. The only thing that he does not do is actually stand up in court and argue a case. We'll have to change that. Yeah, I think actually we should because I've seen Mark argue cases in his office. And, and he's <laughs> with myself. <laughs> and he's pretty convincing. So uh, with that, um, this is the, the overview of, of what we will be covering today. Um, as you can see, we want to talk about the fact that the tax authorities are taking a more aggressive approach uh, on, uh, on transactions, on the review of transactions. They're also taking a more aggressive uh, approach in terms of the, the recourses that they have under the Income Tax Act, like requirements and compliance orders. Uh, and finally, if we have time, I would like to uh, cover also the fact that we've seen in the past few years more and more situations where the tax authorities Uh, actually apply more gross negligence penalties and also issue more uh, reassessment after the normal uh, reassessment period. Oops. Uh, so before we, we talk about, uh, I guess, the, the attitude uh, of the tax authorities, I thought it would be important to maybe set the stage by talking about what we call the, the shift in attitudes towards tax avoidance. And, and to illustrate uh, that, um, I, I think there's, I guess, there's many ways to look at it, but one is to simply look at, at the statistics uh, of the GAR cases. Uh, 
and and we I guess on on this side of of of, of the table, we kind of agree that uh, or generally agree um, that the Oxford property decision has been kind of a there's been kind of a shift since that decision from the Court of Appeal. Um, and, and if you look at the statistics, we see that prior to that decision, a uh, taxpayer would win 55 or 54 case percent of the cases at either at the trial level or at the appellate level. And since then, it has shifted in favor of the CRA. We're at 63% for, uh, for success for CRA at, at the tax court level and 86% success at the Federal Court of Appeal level. The other way to look at it that illustrates this shift that I'm talking about is that prior to that Oxford property decision, the Court of Appeal reversed GAR decision from the Tax Court of Canada uh, on only three cases, and that's three cases out of 24 in a time span of 16 years. And, and you have the three cases that, that got reversed. Since then, and including Oxford property, the Court of Appeal has already reversed three cases out of seven in two years. So uh, at, at least I see this as, as an indication that indeed there is uh, a shift uh, in attitudes towards tax avoidance. Now, the big question, so why, why do we see this shift? Um, is it because of more public scrutiny? Um, because it, it's pretty clear that in the past few years there has, there has been there have been more and more coverage um, of, of tax issues, tax avoidance issues. You have the Paradise Paper and and, and the likes. Uh, you also have uh, taxpayers that that uh, were were sort of caught by the tax authorities not paying what we call the fair share. So is it a question of tax morality? Um, and, and before actually I get to the other points, I, I'd like to get uh, maybe uh, uh, Al's comments on, on those, th those first two bullets about why do we see the shift in attitude? Well, um, you know, maybe this, is a, maybe this business about the shift in attitude is just my way of justifying why we lost Oxford in the Court of Appeal. Uh, maybe you know. Maybe that this is just my excuse for for uh, for losing a big case in the court of appeal. But I think what's happened, and if, if you look at if you look at what's happened generally um, over the last sort of decade in politics, is we've become we we've become a society which um, where there's a lot more populist politics, a lot more. Uh, stuff about whether corporations are behaving, you know, immorally, whether they're paying their fair share of taxes, whether they're uh, whether they're respecting environmental policy. Um, this this idea of public corporations as as you know and, and their conduct has become the subject of a lot of public discussion in newspapers, um, you know. And, and in popular sort of discussion. And it's not surprising that one of the things that has come up is, you know, are they, are, are corporations paying their quote unquote fair share of taxes? And then you see these cases like Starbucks all over the papers and Loblaw, which are, you know, in the US and Europe. And then in Canada, you see cases like Cameco, which were which was all over the papers. Uh, and what's happening is that the public is kind of the, the public sentiment refuses to accept that tax is this technical subject matter where there are rules and <laughs> Parliament writes the law and taxpayers comply with it, which is the way that tax law has been thought of for, for decades. That has changed. Now you have a lot of public interest organizations which don't accept that narrative of tax law. They think that tax law engages some fundamental moral questions. Uh, so, you know, you see stuff like, you know, when we were arguing Cameco, there was a story in one of the papers or one of the news outlets where somebody took the total amount of tax that was on the line and wrote an editorial about how many MRI machines this tax could buy. Uh, or, 
uh, when, um, when the chemical litigation was proceeding, some public interest organizations had billboards from when you leave the Saskatoon airport where chemicals head offices and you drive to the chemical offices, there were big billboards paid for by certain so-called public interest organizations which said, chemical, pay your fair share, stuff like that. And you could see this on big billboards. And so what I'm, what, what's happening is that so there's a sort of a reaction, a political reaction, uh, sort of a populist reaction against a system of law or a system of tax law where, the, where the, they're, they're basically, there's a basically a refusal to accept the idea that this is all about the rule of law and it's all about parliament making laws, companies complying with it, and judges deciding <laughs> what, what the law is. And it's taken on this larger moral narrative. And history teaches us, <clears throat> this is not a new phenomena, history teaches us that courts ultimately start reflecting public morality uh, because they want to be viewed as legitimate institutions. They, they, want, they want the public to have faith in them as institutions which, uh, which uh, you know, they, they, don't, they, want, they don't want to be too far on the wrong side of public opinion. You've seen this in social issues. You've seen this in issues of, you know, human rights, equality. This is just a continuation of that narrative in an area that's previously been immune. And therefore, courts are beginning to echo back some of that thinking uh, and that's why I think the paradigm shift has begun. My own view is it's going to get a lot stronger and courts are going to start shifting much more in that direction before it stabilizes. And if you want to see that in spades, you just need to look at the decision making and the tax cases in New Zealand, in Australia. Uh, in the UK, because they're way ahead of us. They have moved far closer to that way of thinking about tax law. So I think that th this, this is happening because of a larger underlying current, uh, which means, and I'm just going to say this and then stop my long-winded answer, which means that we have to think about these issues differently meaning the days when tax lawyers sat around and cited a statute and pounded the table and said, well, the words say this, so I must be right. That's passe thinking. That is, that is not creative. It doesn't reflect the way that courts think. And it's not the way that we should be thinking about tax law anymore. And it's not the way that we should be making decisions about, about tax planning anymore. Uh, before moving to uh, the next uh, bullet. Uh, Marshall, I, if you could care to comment, I mean, you were on the bench for a number of years uh, about those first two bullets, the public scrutiny and the tax morality uh, in the courts. I'm just getting over a cold. You'll excuse my coughing and, uh, and, and trying to talk with candies in my mouth. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, just to, to pick up on what Al said, um, I, I agree with him that, uh, that the, courts, the courts aren't hiding under the rock. And they are, they're, they're, I don't want to say they're influenced by public opinion, but they, the, the courts may be ahead of public opinion, they may be a little behind public opinion, but they can't be too far out of line with where public opinion is because their judgments have to be credible. And if the judgments that come out are not credible to the public, uh, the, the court loses uh, stature and, uh, and uh, it creates a problem for the judicial system and brings the judicial system a little bit into disrepute. So, uh, so, so the courts... I, I, as I say, I don't want to say they're influenced by public opinion, but uh, it would be wrong to say that uh, they're not aware of it. Um, uh, Al is right, you know, there was a time, and it was a comfortable time for me because I, I believed it, uh, 
that when uh, you were, uh, when judges assess legislation, whether it be tax or any other area, that they read the words, they look at the context, and they look at the purpose of the legislation, and they try to figure out what it means. They look at the facts and tax, they look at the transactions, and they bring an objective view to where, um, uh, to where their decision should be. Uh, and and in in Shell in in the Shell case that Al argued, uh, the court was very clear that it didn't matter if you were a corporation or a wealthy person that could affect the different kinds of transactions. You were entitled to do what the law allowed, and um, and and that has been up to recently, certainly, uh, my view of the way that the courts were and should have been deciding uh, tax cases. Uh, under the general anti-avoidance rule, things were, were different. Uh, usually there, there were multiple, uh, or there, there were often multiple provisions of the act that were being used with multiple tra transactions um, that uh, courts were to look at and decide whether the object, spirit, and purpose of the uh, of the relevant provisions were, uh, were were being adhered to. And so it was going behind the text. And so that started a, that started a, a move away from the traditional role of, of judges of reading uh, reading the text and trying to figure out what the text meant. Now you were under the text, looking at object and spirit of all of the legislation. Uh, and so that, that itself, the, the fact that the GAR was there and, and, and that were, there were more and more cases being decided under the GAR was perhaps an influence on the courts to start uh, uh, perhaps looking a little more uh, uh, broadly at the way in which they looked at legislation than they did uh, before. Uh, just on the question of morality, um, you know, these are, these are civil cases that we're talking about when we're talking about tax. I mean, we're not talking about tax evasion and criminal prosecutions and things like that. So when we're talking about civil cases, uh, we have to, judges have to be careful not to, not to introduce, uh, overly anyway, morality issues. Uh, that's not that's not always easy in terms of public opinion. You know this this discussion about fair share. I, I hate that because fair share. What's well, fair to everyone in this room is going to be different because of their own personal positions. And uh, and what fair share means is that we want somebody else to pay more. That's that's what fair share means. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, I don't like this notion of fair share, but it's out there, that's part of public opinion, and it's a, it's a reality that you have to face. Um, and, but, in, in the end, but in the end of the day, courts have to make sure that their judgments are credible and are receivable by the public, and that's, that's partly what's, what's affecting the nature of the way the judgments are written. Yeah, before I, I throw it to, to Mark, uh, on the notion of fair share, I mean, to me, it, it's, it, it doesn't mean anything because fair share, what's the measuring stick and, and who's going to be applying this test? And are we talking about just taxpayers in Canada? Are we talking about taxpayers in Canada and abroad? Uh, to me, it, it's a red herring. Um, but it, it, it's, I think it illustrates what, what Al was, was talking about when he was saying that there might be some populist <coughs> views that, that, have, that are more, uh, I guess, prevalent uh, in the world, and it, it, it kind of invaded the tax base. Mr. Brender. I think fair share is measured by the sophistication of the taxpayer's planning, frankly. I think the reality is, is that there has been this paradigm shift. The world has changed, and it's, uh, that's an important takeaway in case you haven't experienced it personally, an important takeaway from this, because recognizing this shift will inform the way you approach tax planning going forward and the way you approach dealing with tax audits and tax, con tax controversies uh, generally. The, um, the, this, this issue of populism or fiscal morality, it finds its way to the bench 
and it manifests itself by the bench, by the courts taking a different approach, in my view, as to how they are interpreting the law. It used to be, you know, tax planning 20, 25 years ago was much more formalistic. It was essentially kind of like a shell game, right? We'll move the pieces around this way and that way, and we'll get these nice tax results. And the courts were largely following a very formalistic approach to interpreting the act. Now what we see is that it's not just GAR, but the, 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 the court's approach is much more taking much more substance over form approach to tax planning. And, um, and that's, really, that's really a significant change because a lot of tax planning that was done 20 years ago right, was done in an era where, where values were different, where fiscal morality wasn't an issue where the way the courts view tax planning was much different than the way they're viewed today. And those cases are being judged today uh, by the standards of today. And, uh, and it, makes it, for, makes it, it makes it very difficult. On top of the fact that, that provincial, and federal gov provincial governments and the federal government need to raise revenue, okay, so that, so they, and they have all these uh, weapons in their arsenal, these weapons of mass destruction in the Income Tax Act, where they can, you know, uh, I say it in, in, in jest, but they have weapons that, uh, that where they can impose penalties, gross negligence penalties, sham penalties, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, request documents. They can make life very difficult for taxpayers. And so if you're going to do sophisticated tax planning, you better have, be prepared to have a sophisticated defense and be prepared to, to, to pay some sophisticated fees to defend your tax planning. And, and the government is testing right, the limits of these powers, and we see this every single day in the courts, and it will come out from the, uh, from the slides, which I'm probably going to knock off in these comments, right? a couple of slides in these comments. But the reality is, is that every single day when the cases are released, there's always at least one case dealing with penalties, or opening statute bar years. That's we see it, and and that's that's a battle, real important battlefield. So I think that you know this putting in context where we are today, and for and for 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 businesses operating in Quebec, right? We have the dual pleasure, right, of dealing not just with the CRA, but with the ARQ. And so we have as many files on the go right now. By, where assessments, aggressive assessments, are being issued by Revenue Quebec, where years ago we would have we would have anticipated or we would have expected Revenue Quebec to just sort of sit on the sidelines and let let the CRA do its thing, and then we'll jump in and do a you know do a and do a consequential assessment. Well, they are out there in droves, very aggressively auditing, just as aggressively as the CRA, and interestingly, they are taking these cases to court. You have more cases coming out of the Quebec courts now than you ever did, and it's only going to grow. And we see the stockpile of cases, uh, you know, growing in the Montreal office with revenue arising from revenue Quebec audits. And the Quebec courts are, have not been particularly friendly to taxpayers. And in particular, I come back to sophisticated tax planning, right? This, your, your fair share is really dependent on the level of sophistication of the tax planning. The cases that are going through the courts, the Quebec courts, where corporate taxpayers, businesses, have engaged in, in complex tax planning, I think the record is zero wins for taxpayer. And when you get to the and when you get to the Quebec Court of Appeal, right, on any sort of complex tax planning, the Quebec courts have been very unfriendly to to taxpayers. Um, you know, Iberville is an example, uh, you know, doing tax planning where the words of the act produced, you know, nice benefits, double CDA uh, for the taxpayer. Uh, they did some planning to use uh, off year ends to create deferrals and to, minim you know, to minimize uh, the taxes. And the courts just are not impressed by the shell game. They're not impressed by the, uh, by, by the, the strict words, the text of what the provision says. The Quebec courts, and then we see it more in the federal courts as well, the Quebec courts are simply, you know, looking at what did you do? It doesn't, it, it looks too good to be true. And if it is, if it looks too good to be true, then it is too good to be true. And the courts are coming down hard on taxpayers. Yeah. Okay, so we're uh, 
we did one bullet. <laughs> yeah, but I knocked off ten slides. So, <laughs> so uh, I guess the, the second thing that we want to talk about is is uh, what we see as being a shift on, of the burden. Uh, like when you apply guard, it's a three steps uh, process, and and the last step is to establish whether there was a, a misuse or an abuse of, of the act or a provision of the act. Um, and, and the Supreme Court said that this burden lies with the Crown or with CRA. Uh, and the question that I, that I will throw to, to you guys is, well, is it still the case? Uh, following Oxford property, are, are we still comfortable that, that the courts are applying uh, the teachings of the Supreme Court? Maybe start with you, Al. So, um, look, when, when you read all the Supreme Court cases, starting with Trusco, Coppathorn, and then all the judgments that Marshall Rothstein wrote, which pretty much makes up the law of Canada on, on, on God, what, what was the Supreme Court struggling with? Because these cases were a struggle. They, were, they, were, they're not, they weren't easy cases for the court to decide, and you saw some disagreements in cases like Lipson, et cetera. What was the heart of their struggle? The heart of their struggle is that they're taking this language in the statute which says, you know, abusive tax avoidance is something that's a misuse or abuse. Well, this language really tells you nothing about where the line is between acceptable tax planning and abusive tax avoidance. And so the court struggled for many years to write a legal standard. Because what, is the, what was the concern of the Supreme Court? The concern of the Supreme Court is that the GAR should not devolve into some sort of a smell test so that your fate turns on the judge you get. So if you get a judge who believes that uh, taxes are the price, uh, the price we pay for a civilized society, you lose. And if you get a judge who thinks taxation is expropriation of private property, you win. So we, couldn't, we can't run a system that way. We needed a legal standard that could be applied consistently from taxpayer to taxpayer to taxpayer, and, uh, and there was some predictability and certainty. So that's why the court wrote trust scores well as they did, and Marshall's judgment in Coppathorn, Marshall Rothstein's judgment in Coppathorn, I get to call him Marshall now. I didn't get to call him that before. Um, in Coppathorn, you see that, that, that these decisions are very careful in their saying this is a legal standard, and it's not a smell test. And it worked for a while. But then what started happening is that the Crown started losing a lot of cases, but a lot of people thought they should win. So you know, you saw some of those, uh, you know, you saw some of these provincial income shifting cases. Iberville was decided by the Quebec court in the particular way that it was. But we did a case in BC, which was exactly the same transaction and the BC court went with the taxpayer. Uh, you saw Husky Oil, a court, a case in Alberta, which was another provincial shifting case that we were successful in that the taxpayer won. And a lot of these decisions started coming out and the Crown was losing cases that a lot of people thought, you know, I'm not really sure that this is acceptable tax planning. So there was some doubt being cast about whether the GAR was actually effective in stopping what was perceived as abusive. Um, and, and I think that that doubt kind of hit its high water mark in Oxford when the, you know, the, tra the tax court judge decided that the tr Oxford transaction was just fine. And then when we went to the Court of Appeal, the judgment to me almost reads like the Court of Appeal throwing up its hands and saying, enough. We're not allowing so many of these transactions, which appear to us to be over the line, to keep succeeding because the Supreme Court has drawn such a strict line and a high threshold for the Crown to meet before something is abusive. And so I think that we are seeing a shift. I think the shift is not just in who bears the burden of proving abuse. I think that, that that's, that's sort of a... It doesn't get to the heart of it, but I think this is, this is my prediction, and let's see if over the next few years we see this come true. I think what's going to happen is the courts are going to start saying, if they won't say it explicitly, what's going to animate their judgment is something like, you know, can you tell me why this result is okay? 
Like, seriously, your client did this, and you think that's acceptable? That's not a very legal, you know, that's not a very legal discussion. That's a very visceral reaction. That's a very off-the-cuff. No, not policy-driven. It's not policy-driven. It's, it's almost like, you know, I was, when we teach advocacy, so, you know, uh, Louis and uh, some of the litigators, last week we had a seminar for our young litigators where we were talking about how to argue these cases, and we said to them, the way you need to argue these cases is you need to be able to go home and persuade your spouse that your client did the right thing. <laughs> if you can't persuade your spouse that the client did the right thing, you're going to lose. And you're not going to go home and say to your spouse, well, Section 245 says that something is a misabuse unless the policy works that way. They're not going to listen to that. They don't care about that. They got a gut feeling that your client did something bad. That's, that's something that doesn't work for me because everything the taxpayers do, my wife is says, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's perfect. Well, all right. So I, I, I think we'll pick, we'll, pick, we'll pick a reasonable spouse. <laughs> I've never met your wife. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, my, my wife is, you know, basically is left of Karl Marx. So, uh, so. Oh, she was until until she started seeing her personal tax rates. Then she has missed. <laughs> but, but my point is, my point is, I think you're going to start seeing that. I think you're going to start seeing judges going, you know, I don't actually. I'm not because you know judges are not. They're not. And this is there's there's a creeping sort of sense where they're saying, we well, don't even accept the standard. Show me. So what that means is that the advocacy of these cases has to be different. The advocacy on misuse and abuse has to be different. It has to be more creative. It has to be more supple. It has to appeal to first principles. It can't be the cut and paste tax lawyer approach of opening the green book and saying, see, this is what it says. It's, th there's a shift happening on the way that standard is going to be applied. Okay, uh, Mark or Marshall, any? To add. I'll, I'll briefly say that uh, I've been married for 53 years and I haven't been able to agree with my wife about the time of day. So, <laughs> so there's no, there's, Al's test wouldn't work in my house. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I can only say this, that my first case in, under the GAR was OSFC when I was with the Federal Court of Appeal. It was a very hard case, uh, I have to admit to you. Uh, uh, but the one thing that the OSFC said and that uh, uh, survived through all the GAR cases, at least that went to the Supreme Court, was that the, while the obligation was on the taxpayer when it came to tax benefit and avoidance transaction, the obligation or the onus was on the government when it came to abuse and misuse and that we said the government had to be able to demonstrate a very clear policy because they were going behind what on its face the act would allow taxpayers to do. And if the courts are moving away from that now, they're moving away from jurisprudence that, uh, that has uh, stood for almost 20 years and uh, it will be unfortunate. And I, I think that where we are with GAR and the courts is that I think the courts approach GAR as a smell test. They look at it, they look at the result, they ask themselves, does this offend my sense of fiscal morality? Is this the right result? And then they can easily weave a judgment to justify that result. I think by and large, that's what's been coming out of the tax courts and uh, that's what's coming out of the Quebec courts, uh, be it GAR or SHAM or, other, or some other doctrine. That's, uh, that's reality. And so when you're, when you're engaging in, 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 in tax planning, right, you might have your 50 page opinion from big law or a big accounting firm, right? The fact of the matter is, is that, and that opinion might legally, technically be correct, right? But when you get, when you're testing that opinion in front of, uh, in front of the judge who's not impressed with the outcome, uh, you know, there's enough, the, the provisions of the act are malleable enough that you can get to the result that you want. So I think it's a very, there's a, you have to very much factor in this results oriented approach in your approach to tax planning and in your evaluate your assessment of the merits of your case uh, before court.
And, and also to that point, I, I think it, it also varies a lot depending on the identity of the judge. Um, and, and like Al said, some judges are, might be more lenient, others might be more stern. And, and, and if you fall in front of a judge who doesn't really like tax avoidance, then you're essentially caught in a very bad place. Um, and, and sometimes the, the example I like to give is, is former Chief Justice Bowman. Chief Justice Bowman was, was known as kind of a taxpayer-friendly uh, judge with one very notable exception, tax deduction of interest. For some reason, he had a thing about the deduction of interest and, and a bunch of his cases, I'm thinking of Mark Resources, I'm thinking of let's say Singleton, that was him, Singleton, that ended up in the Supreme Court. For some reason, he, he, he had a, a, a hook on those that he just couldn't let them go. Um, so that obviously that plays that plays a lot on on, on what happens. And mind you, uh, in the days, if, if we go back to the Gar cases, in the days where the, the the Court of Appeal was hesitant to reverse a decision from the tax court, it was even a greater burden. But now it seems like the Court of Appeal, at least recently. Uh, has been more open to reversing uh, guard decisions from the tax court, so it, it may be that it doesn't play exactly the same type. Uh, it, it has the same consequences. Uh, with regards to the last bullet, the certainty, predictability, and fairness, well, I, I think for me it, it's pretty clear that in as much as the test has become a smell test, you can throw that one away um, uh, because as Al mentioned, it was originally what the Supreme Court said is like, look, you're supposed to find what is the policy behind the provisions that you're looking at and then establish whether that policy was offended or not. Um, and, and when you read Oxford, I read it again uh, this week, it, it, it's not that clear which policy, like what, what is the, the underlying uh, information that allows the court to say, well, the policy for this provision is this, and it has been offended. And, and as Al mentioned, it's really a result-oriented analysis that we see in every step of the way, every provision that were looked at, like 197 and others. Uh, Chief Justice Noel every time said that, well, this is a result that, that offends uh, the, the provision. Uh, guys, anything to add on the certainty, predictability, and, and fairness. Well, I think you should keep moving, because you got a bunch of stuff. Here. Hey, we're, it, 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 it's been only 40 minutes. Um, so for, I guess one, one thing that, that also I wanted to, to cover is, is the fact that uh, we're in a very specialized field, um, and, and tax matters in front of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court uh, is, is a different, different beast altogether. Uh, and at the moment, I, I think it's fair to say that we don't have any judge at the Supreme Court who has any interest uh, in hearing or particular interest in hearing tax cases. And, and I would venture that, Marshall, actually, you're probably the last one who, who was on the bench with an interest uh, in, in uh, tax cases. Uh, at the Court of Appeal, at the moment, uh, we have three judges uh, that do have a tax background. Uh, in, in Quebec, the only one that we do see is Chief Justice Noel because he's, he's the only one who can hear uh, a case uh, in French. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was, was the fact that we, in tax, we don't get that often leave granted uh, at the Supreme Court. And, and Marshall, I, maybe I'll, I'll ask you maybe to explain uh, how it works and, and what your experience has been uh, while on, on the Supreme Court. Um, I'll just take a, a few seconds, I hope, to describe the leave process. Uh, the leave materials are filed by the parties, the application for leave. Uh, it goes to a staff lawyer, and the staff lawyer writes a, a, a memo to the judges summarizing what the lawyers have said, summarizing the trial or the Court of Appeal decision, and uh, making a recommendation about whether to grant leave or not. And uh, I, I might say that 30, I think 30 or 35 percent of the leave applications at the Supreme Court level are from self-represented litigants. And so it's very easy to re deal with those very, very quickly. 
uh, for myself, uh, I found another third uh, were able to be dealt with pretty quickly by reading the lawyers, uh, the staff lawyers' memo. Uh, when it came to tax cases, I always uh, obviously read the staff lawyers' memo, uh, but I then read the materials and the the case, of the, the decision being appealed, because frankly, because I was interested. Uh, and uh, and in tax cases, uh, sorry, let me just go back and say. Uh, the leave process is that uh, leave applications go to a panel of three judges, and if the three judges agree, then they will uh, recommend that leave be granted. If they agree, they may recommend that leave be denied. The, uh, a memo will go around to all the judges, and unless somebody has some <clears throat> particular objection, which is very, very rare, then a decision will go out either granting or denying. It's where the uh, panel is split that the uh, leave application goes to a court conference that takes place once a month. And at the court conference, the rule, the unwritten rule is that if you can get four judges to agree to grant leave, then leave will be granted. And uh, so when it came to tax cases, to be very candid with you, it was very difficult to get my colleagues to agree to grant leave in tax cases. Um, I, I, I can't remember this for sure, but I'm almost positive that when it came to Lipson and it came to Copthorne, uh, I, I, I'm sure that I requested that leave be granted. I believe that my colleagues in the three-judge panel opposed, and it went to the court conference. And if you plead and beg, maybe cry, Maybe they'll have mercy on you, and um, and uh, they'll grant leave, and and they did grant leave in those cases. And I suppose maybe I was able to make some argument about something new in in those cases that uh, that at least attracted the uh, the uh, support of three other judges, and so leave was granted. Um, but I, I know that with, uh, with uh, th there was a case called Fundy Settlement dealing with the residency of a trust. And th they did not want to grant leave on that. But the, but, Can but the Supreme Court of Canada had never decided a case on the residency of a trust. In the case of Fundy, it was a foreign trust, a foreign trust outside of Canada. Uh, but, uh, but there's also a question of what province a trust might be uh, resident in. So I thought it was quite important, and uh, I think I barely got four to agree, and so Lynn, uh, Lee was granted in Fundy. But uh, as a general rule, the judges didn't particularly see a lot of interest in the tax cases. I could go through some, some other examples to, uh, to tell you about, um, uh, but, but without dragging it out, uh, I can say that if, uh, if there's no judge that has a particular interest in tax cases of the Supreme Court, it's going to be pretty difficult for leave to be granted. Now, they did grant leave, and they will hear an appeal in the McDonald case, which deals with hedging and whether certain losses in that case were on income or capital account. And my view about why they granted leave in that case is that there had been precedents, very, very old precedents, dealing with uh, grain trading futures and things like that from almost 100 years ago, uh, before there was a capital gains tax in Canada. Uh, and, uh, and, and the courts made certain uh, points in those decisions. And I think that probably now the uh, Supreme Court decided that it was time to update that law in view of uh, the fact that uh, hedging is, is, is quite profound these days and uh, uh, because perhaps they were, they were looking at clarifying the law. So there will be cases where leave will be granted, but it's, it's not easy. Okay, before we move to uh, the next slide, uh, there's, there's two things, I guess two comments that I have. The first one is that from the outside looking in, it, it's hard to see kind of a logic in terms of the cases that the Supreme Court agrees to hear and the ones that are denied. Um, Al mentioned uh, Development Iberville, 
If that might be real, is a decision from the Quebec Court of Appeal that is completely the reverse of the veracity decision from the British Columbia Court of Appeal. So at the moment, the state of the law applying the same provisions is different in Quebec and in the rest uh, of, of the country. And I would have thought that this would have been a matter of national interest to kind of, okay, so let, let Canadians know which way they, they, they can turn. Uh, but like I said, this, this particular one was, was denied. Um, it, it was also denied in Oxford Properties, obviously at, at, at the firm we were very hopeful that, that it would be. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention about Oxford Properties, and, and I guess it goes to the team of, of CRA being more aggressive in its position, without going into the specifics of, of, of the case, I just need to mention that in that case, they had avoided paying income tax on recapture and on a capital gain. Uh, now, obviously most of you know that the recapture is taxable 100%, capital gain 50%. But the GAR assessment was 100% of both. Um, and, and this is obviously very aggressive. Um, and, and I'm a bit, I'm actually as a former Crown prosecutor or deal with Department of Justice lawyer, I'm a bit surprised that they would actually go down the path and make this kind of a punitive uh, provision. We're okay? Okay, so we're up to slide nine. Um, I also wanted to talk about, as, and, and, I, and Mark uh, uh, alluded to that uh, in, in his first uh, intervention, uh, we do have a lot more cases involving the doctrine of sham. And, and sham comes from a, a, an old UK decision that actually has nothing to do with tax. Um, and, and that particular decision was incorporated in Canadian law, and, and you had one famous a quote from the Supreme Court in the Stubart investment case that, that you could see uh, on the slide that talks about an intention of deceit uh, to lead the, the tax collector away from the taxpayer or from the true nature of the transaction. And as, as an aside, uh, Stubart, Stubart led to the enactment of the GAR on one hand, and on the other hand, that case went in those days, you, you would go from the tax court or the tax review board to the trial division of the federal court and then up to the Court of Appeal and then to the Supreme Court. And Revenue Canada had won at every step of the way, but unfortunately for them, they lost once they hit the Supreme Court. And in that case, they had actually argued both sham and ineffective transaction, and those are two arguments that we see more and more often being raised both by CRE and Revenue Quebec. Now, on this slide, I, I gave you uh, four examples of the recent use of sham. Uh, Cameco Al was, was uh, the lead litigator of a, a pretty, pretty sizable team of, of lawyers from, uh, from Ozer. Um, and, and that case, uh, Ozer has won that case um, and, and CRA has decided to drop the sham uh, argument, and, and, and Al will, will expand on that uh, later on. We also have a, another case uh, out of BC, uh, which dealt with the creation of a trust in the province of Quebec. It was actually the Quebec truffle uh, planning, which, which, by the way, has been uh, nipped in the bud uh, by, by the Quebec government. Uh, but again, the taxpayer won uh, on the basis that there was no sham, and for good measure in that case, CRA was also arguing that the trust was not validly created, that, that it was an, eff an ineffective transaction, just like CRA or Revenue Canada had done in, in the Stewart case. Finally, two cases from, from the Quebec courts. Um, those cases were won by Revenue Quebec, but when you look at the facts, they were pretty bad. Uh, you, you had a guy who pretended or uh, argued that he made a donation to uh, family members uh, and he did that at the Christmas party. He said, hey, I'm giving you money, give me, and you're going to give me the check back because you're just such a nice guy. I mean, it, clearly those, the fact pattern in those cases was, was pretty bad. Um, so, Alan, I'm going to... Yes, so, uh, just, uh, La Plante is a, it's a tax court case, Kaplan's Quebec, um, and, and you mentioned the Lee case. That was a tax court case with an inbound 
provincial planning from D.C. into Quebec, and we won that case. <clears throat> there were, interestingly, <clears throat> two cases from Quebec going outbound into Alberta, and those two cases were tried, were heard at the Quebec courts, and taxpayer lost both those cases. So you, you also have inconsistent treatment in, uh, in the two cases between the, uh, two uh, the two jurisdictions, federal and, and, and Quebec. Facts were different in both cases, but nonetheless it shows you how aggressively Quebec is going after these kinds of plans, and they have no patience whatsoever for uh, the, lead the, the fine legal arguments. They just look at you had a gain of $10 million on day one, and at the end of the day that gain was outside of Quebec magically because of some... Uh, some tax alchemy, and uh, they wouldn't have anything of it. So, Al, I'll throw it to you to, you to uh, maybe make some comments about the chemical case. Well, I, I think most of what has been needs to be said about chemical has been said, but I'm just I, I think the interesting development in chemical is that the Crown didn't appeal the sham argument, so the decision of the tax court and Mr. Justice Owen on sham is the law, uh, particularly because that judgment is entirely consistent and relies on the Supreme Court's decision um, um, in Stubart. So I think this is a bit of a setback for the government because what, what was the government's strategy when they invoked sham? I mean, the, the, sh the law of sham in Canada is completely different from the law of sham in the United States. In the United States, the law of sham uh, imports concepts of economic substance and business purpose. Transactions which have, which have no business purpose or transactions which lack economic substance are routinely found to be sham transactions in the United States courts. And the Canadian courts, and Stubart in particular, refused to accept that notion of sham. And they basically said, in order for sham to be found, it is essential that the taxpayer have an intention to deceive the minister. It's, it's very close to an allegation of fraud. And Mr. Justice you know, Owen says that in Cameco. So what their strategy was in Cameco was to see if they could move the law closer to the American law and then argue that transactions which were motivated entirely by tax planning and had no real commercial purpose were essentially uh, sham transactions. So I'll tell you, uh, so, so that, that loss to them is extremely significant, but they haven't entirely given up on it. So I'm going to tell you about a case it's presently in the courts, and I'll, I'll take only two minutes to bring this up. But this is, this is important, so it'll tell you where they are, and this, is, this tells you about how they see sham. So you have a tra case that's in the courts right now where you have a company that is owned by uh, a bunch of tax exempts. And the tax exempts, so this company that is owned by the tax exempts, owns uh, a business, and what happens is that the tax exempts decide to capitalize the operating company with debt. Uh, almost all, it's, it's that, you know, it's highly, highly leveraged, so it's almost entirely debt funded. And of course, so what happens is that the income from the business is being paid up to the tax exempt via interest. And they don't like that because the problem for them is that the tax exempts aren't taxable. So the operating company's income is all ending up in a tax exempt via interest expense. So they have attacked it on the basis of sham. And their argument is that, the, that what the taxpayer put in as debt is really equity. And they say that the taxpayer is representing to the minister that this is debt but in the, its economic reality is that it's actually equity. Now, when you look at the instruments, it's a loan, it's debt, there is interest payable, 
But they're saying, well, but if you look at the way that they ran the business and the way they were conducting things, it, it really was in the nature of equity. Now, we know in the United States, there's law that deals with when you would recharacterize debt as equity. In Canada, we don't accept that notion of recharacterization of debt as equity. We're more of a form-based jurisdiction. We look at the legal relationships. We look at the contracts. We don't tear apart the balance sheet to see what was, quote, unquote, really going on. So they've invoked sham and the case is presently in the courts. Now, this appeal was filed before Chemical came out. And we'll see whether they press on, whether they, because I think that my, my view is that I'm hopeful that Chemical is a bit of a problem for them. Uh, I'm in fact hopeful that it's more than a little problem for them, that it's a big problem for them. But so you see that's a case where they have actually raised sham to, 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 and, and, and the allegation of deceit is, what's the allegation of deceit? Well, you are telling the minister this is debt when it's really equity. But I'm saying, but it is really debt. <laughs> no. So that's an example of how the doctrine is being used. But my own view is that, um, that their, their decision not to appeal sham to the Court of Appeal in Camaco seems to me that the court will say, well, you didn't appeal Justice Owen's reasoning. That's the law. So... I hope that this kind of dies down um, in the next little while. And, and the reasoning of Owen, the, he quoted himself in, in Lee, the next decision. But before we get to Lee, and I, I sense that Mark has a few comments to make, uh, I, I want to talk about the last two bullets uh, on that slide. Um, because I was, uh, last year, I was on a panel with, with Al to talk about Cameco. And my knowledge of the file is that I had read it. Um, be, and the reason I say that is that it was argued more than a year before I joined Osler. So I, I didn't know anything about the case other than what I could read uh, in the decision. And the first thing that struck me when I read the, the decision, and to be honest, I didn't read all of it. There's some of the uh, uranium stuff that I, I, I kind of zoomed by because it's, it's a pretty lengthy decision. It might be the, length, the, the longest decision that was ever issued by the Tax Court of Canada. But all kidding aside, so I was looking at, at the sham argument, and first of all, I did not understand why they raised it, because if, if you're familiar with transfer pricing, they, they issue the, like a straight-up transfer pricing uh, assessment saying that, look, you, you undersold. Uh, uh, but they also... They also raised the, the recharacterization provision of, of the transfer pricing uh, provision, um, which, which is, to me, akin to a sham argument. And I was, for the life of me, I did not understand why they would add sham uh, to it. The other thing that was pretty clear to me is that Justice Owen was annoyed when he had to deal with the sham argument. Uh, and, and I actually asked Al if, if, if he agreed with that. Um, but, but from a reader was not at all involved in, in, in preparing the case. Uh, that's what I, that's what I saw in re reading his decision. And it may be that this painted the way that he saw the straight up application of uh, the transfer pricing provision. And, and I guess the, the, the last bullet, uh, is also important. And I, I guess it goes to Mark's point that that we, we see this uh, even more so from, from Revenue Quebec. If, if they see a planning that works, uh, they think that, well, if it worked, then there, must, the, there was a tax motive, and then the, it makes your, your transaction uh, a complete sham. And, and Owen said that in Cameco, and he said it again in Lee. Uh, it's not because you have a tax motive that a transaction automatically becomes a sham. And I agree uh, with Al's comments with respect to Lee and Cameco not appealing on the sham point uh, where we are, but I think that we can still expect the Revenue Canada and Revenue Quebec in particular to try to move the needle on what sham is. We have the sham uh, rules which were introduced by Revenue by, by uh, Finance Quebec this summer. Uh, you know, don't turn a blind eye to those. Uh, we see sham being raised as an argument uh, in, in many cases. And it's likely that given that there's a penalty associated with it, given that where sham is applied, uh, there are severe consequences, opening of statute barred years, uh, 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 pr uh, prohibition in participating in government contracts. Uh, 
it is a real weapon, and, it, and, and that prohibition applies from the assessment, not from a, a final determination by a court. So Sham is, I think, going to get a lot of airplay in Quebec, and I think, uh, I, I think that we, we need to be very mindful of that. You know, the one case that I think is worth kind of reminding people about, because Sham can arise in circumstances that you might not really think about as being Sham-like, you know, and um, and it just makes me think of that commercial sham wow. You know the sham wow, the sham. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Yeah, it's not so wow in in in, in tax matters. But in the Antle case, right, where a taxpayer with a huge with a, with a huge accrued gain, right, sets up a series of transactions, all technically sound, transfers the asset to a spousal trust, which is set up offshore. So the gain is effectively rolled out of Canada, and then the trust disposes of the shares, realizes a huge gain, and the trust happens to be resident in Barbados, and under the Canada-Barbados Treaty claims a tax exemption. And so that case was defeated based on sham. Why was it a sham? Because the trust was, a trust deed was created, the transactions were legally effective, everything was done. And the reason that the court held that it was a sham was because they said, well, this trust, which you called a discretionary trust, and the terms of the trust provided for discretions to the trustee. Uh, ultimately, that when you look at the series of transactions, it was all preordained, and really there was never any intent to exercise discretion. All these transactions were just going to happen. There was a domino effect that once you, you know, once you push the first domino, everything else was going to follow. And so, in that case. It, the court, uh, this is at the Federal Court of Appeal, applied sham and basically disregarded the trust and it defeats the whole, uh, the whole tax plan. So this can apply in many different contexts, right? When you're putting up sophisticated structures, domestic, international planning, foreign affiliates all over the, you know, cor corporations being set up. And if these corporations are not being respected, are not being treated the way they're supposed to be treated, again, they're not just sort of you know, they're not just shells on a, on, or, you know, they're not just pieces on a chessboard where you just move them around. That I, I can see the, uh, I could see revenue taking a run at corporations in certain circumstances being a sham because the taxpayer is not really respecting its existence, not really treating them the way they're supposed to be treated. They just have them as boxes, tick and move on. Um, so I'll pause. Uh, I'll pause there. Uh, Marshall, I, 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 I'll just make a brief comment. You know, sham is essentially an allegation of fraud or deceit, and at least traditionally, for, uh, for when when somebody pleads fraud or deceit in a civil action, the burden and the hurdle should be very, very high. And I think that many judges, and this may may perhaps be the reflection that Owen had when he looked at the sham argument in Cameco, uh, a judge will look very skeptically at a sham argument unless it's pretty obvious that there was deceit or, or fraud of, of some sort. So I would say this, CRA is going to have to be fairly careful in the way that it alleges sham in various cases. If it willy-nilly uh, alleges sham all over the place, I think that there will be a loss of credibility in their in, in their arguments, and uh, that that won't redound to their favor. So uh, I, I, while while it appears that they are arguing it more, it uh, it may be it, it may lead them into a pretty risky area. You know, and Marshall, I I would uh, I would hope that because in Quebec the consequences of having sham applied are so severe because there's a 50% penalty, I believe, and the extension of the, the opening of statute bar years, I would hope that courts would actually raise the bar for when they would apply it. Well, the bar should be high when, when in civil cases, when, when fraud or deceit are being uh, argued, um, uh, it's a very serious argument to be made. It's not. It's not just a run-of-the-mill argument, and uh, courts should be taking a very, very careful look at that before they quickly uh, uh, agree that there's a sham.
Uh, thank you, Marshall. I think it, this is a nice uh, segue into the next slide because uh, Mark touched on it, um, the first bullet about the new measures that were announced by Finance Quebec. And, and as uh, Mark mentioned, uh, if, if an assessment based on sham is sustained, there's going to be an automatic 50% penalty, um, which to me is, is kind of strange because if sham entails an element of deceit, so there's an intention uh, to to present something that is different from the reality. So I'm, I, I kind of struggle to see situations where uh, an argument of sham would be sustained, but gross negligence penalty would not. But still, uh, Finance Quebec decided to do that. At the same time, they decided to increase uh, the automatic GAR penalty from 25 to 50 percent. Um, and, and I guess to, to, to Mark's uh, point, uh, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll throw that to, uh, to both Al and, and Marshall. Um, my take on it is that, uh, as, and, and I guess Mark agrees, obviously, given the consequences that courts might be more reluctant to conclude that indeed there is a sham or that GAR is applicable. Uh, so I'll... Marshall, you want to begin with, with that well, one? Well, I'll only say this. I, I don't want to be repetitive, but, um, but, but it should be a high hurdle for sham. In the case of the GAR, you know, the, the way the, the case, cases have rolled out, they have made the point mm -hmm. that the abuse has to be based upon a clear policy uh, of, the, of the act. And so uh, it would strike me that if, if that is, is the focus, uh, that, that unless the policy is, is, is found to be totally clear, or at least or I should put it this way, the court should only find an abuse where they are satisfied that the policy is clear. If they come to that conclusion, then the consequences will follow whatever they whatever they are. But the question is, is the policy clear in the case of the uh, in the case of the GAR, and uh, and in the case of SHAM, uh, is it that doesn't meet the high hurdle? And if it if it doesn't meet the high hurdle, that's the end of it. If it does, again, the consequences follow. Well, I guess it remains to be seen, but I mean, I, I, I know, for instance, that Mark has a number of, of uh, clients who are dealing with Revenue Quebec where they are raising uh, sham allegations in a very plain vanilla structure. Uh, and, and you kind of, when you talk to them, you kind of bang your head on the wall because you, you, you get the feeling that you are talking to a wall. Um, so I guess we'll have to wait and see what, what the uh, chemical and lead decisions uh, will, will lead to. Uh, I would add, uh, before we move to the next topic, that the Antle Trust case that, that uh, uh, Mark was referring to um, was actually the linchpin of, of the argument that was made by the Crown uh, in, in Lee. Um, but there was one very significant difference. Um, in, in Lee, you had a very experienced uh, trustee, whereas in, in Antel Trust, you had a guy who was 19 or 20 years old, I forget, uh, and his experience in, in trust matters was that he was asked to read a book about trust, and they may or may not have read all of it. Uh, so obviously, he, he was seen by the court as someone who was essentially a puppet that would just do blindly whatever uh, the author of the trust uh, or the creator of the trust uh, would ask them to do. The next thing that I wanted to talk about in that we've seen from, from Revenue Quebec is uh, lost consolidation transactions that, that are being uh, disputed by Revenue Quebec. So uh, essentially a lost consolidation is that within a group you, you, you would have corporations that are in a prof profitable position and other at a loss position. So how do you want to kind of balance that out? So you, you carry on transactions that allow you to either transfer income from one corporation to the other or transfer tax attributes. And, and, and to be clear, those type of transactions have been going on for ages. And, and in, in the first memorandum that, that Revenue Canada 
uh, at the time of the issuance of, of or the enactment of GAR, the first memorandum that they issued on the matter to talk about what is acceptable, what is not, included uh, a paragraph confirming that loss consolidation within the corporate group was, was legitimate tax planning. But nonetheless, uh, we see, uh, and when I say we, I, I mean uh, Osler in, 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 in Montreal, uh, two files that, 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 um, that we are working on. Um, the first one, uh, the loss consolidation was done through the transfer of depreciable assets. So you, when that happens, you have recapture in, in the company that sold um, uh, the, the asset, which in this case was the, the loss corporation. And then the profitable corporation would claim capital cost allowance. Now, one thing that is important to mention is that that particular transaction was actually reviewed and accepted uh, by the Canada Revenue Agency. Um, also, um, what the impact on, on the Quebec uh, income tax was not even considered um, and because the presence of, of that corporation that was profitable in Quebec was only 4% of its total interprovincial allocation. Now, this matter was audited by Revenue Quebec and they took three years thinking that GAR applied, and finally they said, okay, we agree GAR does not apply. But then they turn around and they say, well, you, you purchased this, uh, this asset, but you did not do it for the purpose of earning income, ergo we're going to refuse the capital, uh, the capital cost allowance claim. Finally, they, they do realize that the structure was, was, the way that it was structured, there was uh, income that was paid, so they, they dropped that one, and then they turn around and they apply the leasing property rules uh, to that particular transaction. Um, now, that case, uh, we're still waiting. It, it was argued in, in April. We're still waiting for a judgment. If, if there's no extension of the six months uh, normal deadline for the issuance of the judgments, we should have a decision, I believe, in December. Uh, I see my team was nodding yeah. So yes, sometime in December, but I, it, it's not the first time that I've argued a case in front of this judge, and my experience is that he, he keeps asking for extension, so it, it might be a while. Uh, before I move to the next one, I don't know, Mark, or... I would just say that on loss consolidation, I mean, think of, think of BEPS, base erosion and profit shifting. It, it's not just an international concept, it's a domestic concept, okay? so. So the provinces, in Quebec in particular, are going to be very sensitive to transactions that have, have the effect of, of eroding the Quebec base. So a large interest expense in Quebec paid out to a non-Quebec taxpayer, for example. Uh, Interprovincial management fees and the like. Uh, loss consolidation arrangements where, uh, where the proportion of income between the loss co and the profit co are materially different when you're doing the loss consolidation. You're moving income from a, you know, a taxable from from a Quebec taxpayer to a non-Quebec taxpayer. That's going to be perceived as as being problematic. So we need to be sensitive to the sort of BEPS concept, if you will, in the domestic context. Uh, the next example that, that we have in Montreal, again, it, it's a case that is in front of uh, the Quebec or the Court of Quebec, I should say, um, and it's still at, at, at the pretty, uh, uh, like we're, we're not even close to uh, getting a, a, a day in court. But so in this case, it, the, the, the consolidation was done through uh, an interest-bearing loan. Um, so you have a, a corporation that is newly created, so it doesn't have any history, doesn't have any assets. Um, and and, and it, it, it has this demand loan to, uh, or issued this demand loan to a profitable corporation of the group. Now, the shares of that newly created corporation are transferred to another corporation of the group that is in a lost uh, position. Uh, the corporation is wound up, so you end up with an interest deduction in the profitable corporation and interest income in the lost corporation. Now, in this case, the angle of attack of, of Revenue Quebec is to say, well, the, the, interest, the interest rate that you use for that loan is too high. Uh, and, and their benchmark for that determination is uh, the interest rate that the parent company, that has nothing to do with uh, the transaction, they're not involved in the transaction, uh, 
but the interest rate that this particular parent company could get on the open market. Uh, and, and, and to me, that's kind of a, an argument that, that resembles the ALO uh, effect that, that we've seen in, in a case that you're very familiar with, uh, Al, the GE Capital case. So I, I, I'd like to see if you have any comments, and maybe Mark also, on, on, on that particular argument in that context. You want to go first? Well, um, this is a, this is an area that there's, there's two cases that actually speaks to this issue. One is General Electric, and the other one is a case out of Alberta called Nmax Energy, and um, and 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 the question of whether I, th I think as you know this. I could be wrong, and my, my colleagues will correct me on this. Feel free to dissent from what I'm about to say if I'm wrong. But my, my impression is that this question of um, the reasonability of interest rate turns on whether, when you're assessing reasonability, you take into account implicit support. All of these cases have that notion of implicit support or what Louis calls the halo effect of the parent. I think that in the context of international disputes, such as GE, the law appears to be quite settled, is that you assess the reasonability of the interest and you must take into account the so-called halo effect. And why is that? Because that's how markets will assess you know, if you go to a bank, they will assess the amount of interest they should charge you by reference to the amount of implicit support you're getting from the parent. So that's sort of the GE line of, line of cases. And, the, and, and GE is now really set a law. It's been accepted in the U.S. The OECD has accepted it, et cetera. So the question really becomes when you're outside the international context and you're in a domestic concept, context, when you're determining a reasonable rate of interest, should you take implicit support into account, particularly when somebody says, well, if there is implicit support, why is it unreasonable for the recipient of that implicit support to include as part of the amount of interest it pays some form of compensation for that support? <clears throat> so that issue is unsettled. Um, and I, I, I really don't know how the courts are going to respond to it. Uh, my advice is always on, these, on this issue because it's so uncertain, is you need to argue these cases assuming a finding of implicit support and then demonstrate that even with implicit support, the interest rate was reasonable, which is what we did in GE. Because remember in GE, we lost the implicit support argument, but the court came back and said, well, you may lose it on the legal principle, but we were successful because we called expert evidence on the facts. Yeah, and I, I concur with that. Uh, just not to, not to dwell on implicit support, because like I said, I, I agree. But I would say that, you know, bear in mind that these cases where interest rate is being challenged, these are transfer pricing cases, essentially, domestic or international. And so revenue, can attack those on, tra on transfer pricing uh, or on, and that they are attacking these cases, in at least the ones I'm thinking about, they're attacking them because they see them as avoidance transactions, right? I have a, can a Canadian company that's profitable, I've got a U.S. subsidiary that's not profitable, and I have pricing between them and there may be some interco debt, and they don't like the, move, the shift of profits from Canada to the U.S. If there's, if there's an interest expense created in the structure. Uh, Mark Resources is, is a perfect example of that. Mark Resources might have been decided differently if it was a domestic interest expense case, but it wasn't. It was basically a loss utilization structure. So this is underlying the, the, the CRA's uh, uh, perception and, and as well the courts. So they can attack it based on transfer pricing principles, implicit support, uh, whether it was used for the purpose of gaining or producing income or for the acquisition of property. There's a number of, of, uh, of legs on which these uh, can be attacked, but ultimately they are viewed as, as avoidance transactions. Yeah, so I'm not going to dissent on what you said, Al, um, but I, I will make some comments uh, with regards to uh, 
the case that we uh, which one? In, in, the, in your case, what was the support uh, for your client to, uh, to assess the, uh, the, the interest rate? The, well, actually, the, that's an excellent question, and it's <clears throat> going to go exactly to my comment. So uh, in transfer pricing, in theory, there is one answer that is supposed to be a precise answer. A, in theory, I said that. Uh, now, when you're dealing with uh, 21C, like reasonable rate of interest, uh, the, the reasonable amount does not necessarily have to be a precise amount. If it's within a range, it's going to be considered to be reasonable. Um, now, in the case of, of our client, the interest rate is within a range that we could see on the open market. Um, now, we don't know if Revenue Quebec is going to argue that it should be a precise figure, whether it's median, whether it's like top, Quartile, mid-quartile, I, I, we don't know at the moment, uh, but the support that we have is that, yes, it is within the range. Does that answer your question, Najwa? Well, we, we, have, we, we have an analysis, yeah. And, and thank you for being the first one to ask a question. Maybe, maybe someone else will... Uh, We'll jump in and, 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 and ask questions. It's going to be a waterfall of questions. <laughs> oh, we have 20 minutes or less uh, remaining. Um, so uh, this is actually the, the end of, of the first section. So I guess the, 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 the key takeaways I think you have figured out by now, but we, we are in a situation where there is a shift, uh, at least in the tax avoidance space. Um, we do see more aggressive positions taken by both CRA and, and Revenue Quebec. Um, and, and the last one is that I, I called it like sideways attack on, on legitimate tax planning um, that had nothing to do uh, with the provisions that they're using to, to attack it, uh, namely the, the tax, uh, the, the leasing property rules in one case and, and the interest deduction provision in the other one. So the next segment is more aggressive use um, of administrative tools. and. I've listed a number of, of decisions that were rendered in the past few years. Um, I thought was interesting because it's a case that deals with, um, so CRA does an audit, they, they're not satisfied with the cooperation of the taxpayer, eventually they send a requirement. They're still not satisfied with, uh, with uh, the uh, cooperation, so they go to the federal court and ask the court or a compliance order to force the taxpayer to provide the documents. And as part of the request, the order says, and to provide in Excel format the list of transactions that were conducted by the company. Um, and, and of course, the taxpayer did not respond to that one. Uh, so now there's another motion that is filed by CRA uh, for contempt of court. Uh, and to have the taxpayer file in, com in contempt, and, and the, the, court, uh, the federal court said, well, you, you have the right to get the information, but you don't get to choose the format in which uh, you get, uh, you, you're going to receive it. Uh, the next one, Montana, again, uh, it, it, it's, it's actually a dispute about uh, how the documents should be sent or received by CRA. Uh, take it for what it's worth, because that's actually a case where there was a guerrilla war between the taxpayer's lawyer and a CRA that lasted five years. Uh, and during that period, CRA was trying to audit the taxpayer and, and could not do anything. And, and the last straw was that they finally get a motion, uh, or I guess an order from the federal court saying, okay, so you need to provide uh, the list of documents, and when you read the decision, the list of documents is actually much longer than the decision itself because you have schedules upon schedules of, of documents that they were looking at and looking for. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end, so the taxpayer says, okay, so we have those documents there in 30 boxes, come and, and, and audit them at, at my premises. To which CRA says, no, 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 uh, send us, we, we want them we want to pick them up or we want you to ship them to, to us, to which the taxpayer says no. Um, and that's when there was the final order by the court, the federal court saying, no, no, you, you had a very reasonable 
solution that was provided by CRA who was offering to send a courier to pick up those 30 boxes, and you said, no, this is unreasonable. And so, I mean, like I said, take it for what it's worth. Um, a motion that we're going to talk about in, in greater detail in chemical where uh, in the middle of, of the tax court case, uh, you, you had uh, a motion to compel Cameco to, to offer 25 employees for uh, interviews. And as, as you can see there, um, I guess we, we lost at, at the trial level, but, but one of them. We won at both levels. No, no, I'm talking about on, <laughs> on the administrative side. Yes, we won at the trial level too. Okay, so I'm mistaking it for the <laughs> other one. Um, yeah, I'm mistaken for BP Canada Energy. Sorry about that. Uh, the last one that, that you must have heard time and time again, so a motion to obtain the uncertain tax position of working papers in the BP Canada Energy a case that was unsuccessful at the trial division and successful at the Court of Appeal. Uh, the other one, Igalis Holdings, uh, trying to get their hands on, on the legal opinion. Again, they were successful at the trial division, but CRA lost at, at the Federal Court of Appeal level. And I think it's important to mention that CRA actually asked the Supreme Court for leave in that case, but it, it was denied. Um, another example is, is the due diligence report that we have in the Atlas II uh, file. Uh, taxpayer lost at the federal court, but the matter is before the Court of Appeal, so we'll have to wait and see uh, what, what's going to come of that one. So my questions to, to I guess, the, the four of us is, well, those this more aggressive behavior from the tax authorities, and I guess in this case it, it's really a CRA, not necessarily Revenue Quebec, but how does it change the tax environment for taxpayers? How does it impact the resolution of tax disputes? And and how do you strike a balance between picking up a fight uh, because you're right uh, and, and getting involved in a very lengthy and costly uh, legal battle? Um, maybe, Al, I would, I would move, before we, we cover all of this, maybe I will ask you to cover um, in chemical, how did it come about and what impact did, did that motion for the interview of those 25 employees what did it have on, on, on the actual conduct of the case? Well, in summary, we're in, we're in the middle of the litigation for the years that were in court. I think it was 2003 that was in court. And the CRA starts auditing the subsequent years, and they say, we want to interview 25 people. So we, uh, we said, well, I'm not sure we're going to let you interview 25 people because we're in the middle of litigation, and we think... We've done discoveries. You've examined us to death on these transactions, and really nothing has changed. The structure is the same. The contracts are the same. In fact, in the subsequent years, we were dealing with the very same contracts that were in court. It was just picking up more income under the same contracts. So we said that we're not willing to allow um, 25 people to be interviewed in the middle of litigation. And it, it wasn't even 25 people. It was, it was just... It was frankly a bit over the top. You know, they named 25 people who were working in Canada and Switzerland and the U.S., and then they went on to say, and this is not a complete list. We will give you more names as we go across. So we said, well, we don't really think we're going to play this game. Uh, but, you know, we, we decided that, and this is something that's often lost when people read this case, is that the part that, that doesn't come out is that Chemical actually made a big effort to try and resolve this. Uh, they said, you know, uh, give us your questions in writing. Uh, we'll answer them. Uh, tell us what part of, we'll tell you what's changed from before. Uh, this wasn't, you know, this, this case often comes across as what happens is CRA wanted 25 people in Chemical said, go away, we're going to court. That, that was not what happened here. This was a case where the taxpayer worked really, really, really hard to resolve the dispute with CRA. And it was our view that that's what should happen because, you know, litigation is expensive. It's time consuming. It causes stress and unnecessary fights with CRA. Is not a, it's not a good thing. It, it's not in anybody's interest. So it, it, it was at the end of the day that we said, look, we just can't reach an agreement. And then they served the requirement on us. And we said, we're not going to comply with this requirement. And they went to court and asked for the compliance order. 
and it went to uh, the trial court where the trial court said, and, and the reason I think if you read that judgment, you, when you read the trial decision judgment, you see how important it was that chemical was reasonable. The trial judge goes out of her way to the motion search, cite the thing. She says, you know, chemical for to do this and chemical for to do that. And, um, and, um, and, uh, and also the, the judge, I think the judge saw that this was not a case of an unreasonable taxpayer trying to hide stuff, trying to stop the audit, trying to get in the way of things. This was a taxpayer who was dealing with a $3 billion case in the tax court and was busy with all of that. And all of these people were going to testify and they wanted the litigation not to be contaminated, but they were willing to work with the CRA to solve the problem. And I think that that really moved the trial judge to say that she's not going to exercise her discretion and order of compliance because of that. And then when it went up to the uh, Court of Appeal, um, you see two sets of reasons, and you see Justice Woods relying on the facts and saying the facts of this case are such that the trial judge, uh, the motions judge exercised her discretion and said, I'm not going to order it on these facts because it's unreasonable. The majority didn't go down that road. The majority said, simply under the law, the CRA doesn't have the power. So the teaching from chemical, and I, I really want to emphasize this because people get lost, the teaching from chemical is not to go and you know, knock heads with the CRA every time. That's a bad idea. The teaching from chemical is do everything you can to resolve it uh, and, and make sure there's a record of all of the things you're doing to resolve it. And then when a fight comes, because you know, the judge is gonna wanna do the right thing. She's not gonna want to stop the CRA from doing their audit. The CRA has a right to audit you, whether you like it or not. But she also wants to make sure that the CRA is not being heavy-handed. And this came across as a CRA being heavy-handed. Marshall. I, I must say that when I looked at, uh, uh, at, the, at the order or the request by CRA to, uh, to uh, interview 25 people at the audit stage, I, I, it sounded unreasonable to me. And I think that it obviously was unreasonable to the judges at the, uh, the trial judge and <clears throat> at the court of appeal. And uh, the CRA is going to have to be careful with how aggressive they get. I mean, they can get legislation changed, I suppose, um, that will authorize this kind of thing. But, uh, uh, but that, that was clearly overstepping. In the Agilis case, that was the common interest privilege case where a buyer and seller of property uh, got together and wrote a joint opinion uh, to do the transaction in the most tax efficient way, and CRA was after their legal opinion. And the issue was, is there such a thing as common interest privilege in, in Canada? And the, the trial judge's name was Peter Annis. Anybody here related to him? Anybody here a friend of his? I think it was one of the worst decisions I've ever read in my entire <laughs> life. It was terrible. It was huge. It was lengthy. It was a polemic. It used some obscure stuff from the New York State judgment and from some teacher, some, some professor at some university about common interest privilege. It took the Court of Appeal Five, I think the judgment was 18 pages long, but Annis' judgment was 100 pages long. It took the Court of Appeal 18 pages, uh, uh, and, and that was two, uh, that was, uh, uh, that was the first, uh, first 10 pages were all about the facts and the trial judge and all of that stuff. The, the decision was actually about five pages. And, and, and there's obvious, I, 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 to me, it is quite obvious that there is such a thing as common interest privilege, where two parties are doing a transaction and they have the same interest, uh, which in this case was for, for, for it to be a tax efficient uh, transaction. Uh, I, I don't know, it's, it seems pretty obvious that that's a common interest sufficient to uh, engage common interest privilege. And so uh, I, I think that the CRA was really overstepping uh, 
uh, in that case, trying to get the legal opinions uh, um, from the from the parties. That's it. Yeah. Okay. It's or oh, unless you want to really say what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Annis is a very nice guy. <laughs> He's just a bad judge. <laughs> um, uh, Mark, do you, do you want to chime in on, on, I guess I just went back to... Uh, very, very quickly, like, as I said at the outset, uh, revenue is testing the limits of their powers. So who would have thought uh, once upon a time that you'd be required to produce your due diligence report, right? That provides a pretty nice roadmap to revenue of all the issues that they would not have been thinking about. Uh, trying to get legal opinions, uh, working papers, etc. It's all about making the audit as easy as possible and exposing the taxpayers' weaknesses. So this is just a perfect example of, of how aggressive the CRA uh, is. And you know, when you and but I, I agree with Al that the idea is not just to resist the requests at the outset; is to try to work with them, find the middle ground. We just recently were hit with the client was hit with requirements where they've asked for you know all emails relating to uh, to certain transaction and that's pretty unreasonable right people have businesses to run you know you're gonna run into the CEO and CFO and start saying okay now you know go through six years of emails from five years ago uh, that's you know that's very disruptive and and you need to sensitize the auditors to that and generally I think they, they can be reasonable but some are, are unreasonable this request this requirement that was issued recently is asking for all emails there's no identification of issues. There's no, it's not clear to us exactly what the problem is or exactly what it is or, or what the scope of the total audit is. And I would say to you, that's, that's an unreasonable request. That's just an auditor who says, I have the power under Section 231 to issue a requirement and I'm going to do it and I'll wait and see what happens. And so, you know, you can see the, the, the trend here and, um, and, and don't expect it to change, but at the same time, we find a way to work with the uh, with the auditor. Find out what issues you're interested in. Uh, can we narrow the 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 request, and then formalize that with a confirmatory letter saying, you know, because they've issued this requirement. Once the requirements are issued, and you don't respond to it, you're into a judicial process, potentially in contempt of court, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and and, and I guess to your point, Mark, I, I've seen situations where. They're just asking for correspondence emails without necessarily limiting the scope uh, of, 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 I guess, what those emails or correspondence uh, we're dealing with. And, and then you get with just a ridiculous amount uh, of, of time just to try to retrieve all those. And, and the reality is there's no way that CRA auditor is going to look at all that. They're looking for the smoking gun, right? Yeah, but are, are they, for instance, if, if you have, I mean, I, I, I Kind of remember from one of your files that that one of your clients was asked for like 3,000 emails. But I, I mean, do you really think that the auditor or what is he going to do? He's going to put that in in a computer and and with a search function is going to be looking for smoking gun or let let how how do we uh, how do we uh, I just have a very bad word in my uh, how do we. Uh, <laughs> So how can we take can take advantage of, of uh, the government? Um, but in any event, I, I think it, it, it is something that, that we're going to see more and more often. I, I certainly agree with Al that, that it, it, it is better to try to be uh, to try to solve the issue before it, it gets too far. Uh, if anything uh, like it happened in, in that case that you were part of uh, in Cameco, it shows that you have clean hands. And that you try to to accommodate uh, CRA, and they're the, they are the ones who are being uh, unreasonable. And and I would add that it, it was the same situation in the BP uh, Canada Energy file, uh, where every time that the auditor had a question uh, that ended up on the path for asking for the working papers, an answer was provided, and and whatever issue was dispelled, but. She came back for more, and she came back for more, and every time there was an answer. Uh, and at the end of the day, when at least when you read the decision from Chief Justice Noel, you get the distinct impression that the, the CRA auditor, she asked for it because she felt that she had the right to ask for it. She didn't really need it, but 
she had the right to ask it. And, and, and when you read the decision, time and time again, Noel is saying, so what we have in this case is an auditor insisting on getting access uh, on, on those working papers for taxation year, when the taxation years were already assessed and, and the issues were already, I guess the fi her file was, was complete. Um, and, and I think, and I guess maybe you tell me out, but, but I think that that had a big role to play on, on, on Chief Justice Noel's uh, decision to, uh, to reverse, uh, oh, I guess to, to reject uh, CRA's position. Yeah, uh, that's clearly right. I, I think that one thing that one, one, one lesson from BP is I often hear taxpayers say, well, BP is out now and we don't have to provide our tax accrual working papers. I don't think that's what BP stands for. BP is a very specific case dealing with specific facts and a specific situation. And you need to manage the process. BP won only because the process was well managed when the demands were made. Uh, but there are situations where it's not, it doesn't, there's no blanket rule that the CRA has no right to tax accrual working papers. I don't think that's a lesson in BP. It's a very fact specific case. And just to state the obvious from a practice standpoint, right, privilege is important, okay? And you can, you can seek to protect your working papers with privilege or your, uh, your uncertain positions with privilege or your due diligence reports with privilege, properly structured. You can't do it after the fact. And I think this is something that, you know, going forward, that we should all be considering. Well, I guess that's a nice segue into uh, the next slide. Mark is always a few slides ahead of the uh, <laughs> presentation. <laughs> uh, I guess w one thing that, that I wanted to mention, uh, the second bullet in this slide, so, Essentially what CRA has said uh, after uh, the chemical decision is that nothing has changed and we still expect you to, uh, uh, to, to I guess, to answer uh, uh, all the questions that we might have. Um, at least that's my take. I don't know. Uh, Silly. <laughs> what, that, what that decision, they quote out of the, uh, they quote out of the decision and it's, it's and frankly, intellectually facile, what they're saying here, because yeah, if the a CRA auditor shows up on your premises and says, can you show me where the GL is? Yeah, you're supposed to answer that question. But if the CRA says, uh, I want to interview somebody for 20 hours, okay, the answer to that is no. So what they're doing is they're taking these comments about you have to be, you have to cooperate with the CRA and give them your books and records and answer basic questions. And yeah, that's always been an obligation, but that's not what taxpayers are fighting about. They're fighting about questions which are overly intrusive. So I, I don't, I don't worry too much about that. What do you worry about? Um, not much anymore, you know. <laughs> Um, I guess on, on this slide, uh, we're talking about, okay, so what, what's going to be the, like the real impact? Uh, and, and maybe I'll, I, I mean, at the firm, we have a number of, of transfer pricing uh, uh, files. Uh, are you aware of any specific impact on, on, on those audits or the way that those files are, are being treated? Um, well, they, they ask for interviews, and most of the time that they we we, we and every we've got a whole bunch of big transfer pricing audits and cases going forward, and the CRA obviously asks for interviews, and we say, sure, we're happy to work out something with you, which is reasonable. So tell us what you want to learn, and they say, we want to interview you know ten people that do this, and we go, well, no, that's not a good idea. But tell us what it is that you want to learn. And they say, well, we want to learn about your business. We want to learn about where the functions are. We want to learn about where the different risks are. We want to learn about, um, you know, what assets are employed. And I say, okay, seems to me, based on that, we're going to put forward three really senior people. One is going to deal with how our operations are organized. The second one will answer your economic questions, such as, you know, how is the transaction structured and the economics of it. And the third one will explain what kinds of risks take place. You don't need 20 people. Here are three. We'll schedule them back to back. And how about we give you a day each with somebody? And they say, that's not enough. We need five. And we go, no, we'll give you a day. So what I'm saying is 
what are we trying to do here? We, we're not, we, I just tell our team, put yourself in the position of a judge who is going to hear a subsequent compliance order and he'll hear the story of what you proposed. And you want to be in a position where the judge says, taxpayer is being compliant and reasonable and helping. So, I, I, and, 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 and the point is, just, just to be clear, most of the time it works. Uh, chemical is an aberration. 99.9% .9 of the time, we work it out, and, uh, and it, it just goes smoothly. I just think it's about managing the process better. I guess the way you describe this is usually the way it is, right? They want to know three things. Set up, I mean, they're happy for you to handle everything. Why wasn't chemical de-escalated administratively? Like, why didn't you just go to, to the person's supervisor and say, look, there's not going to be a 25-person interview. At some point, you usually speak to someone and they say, I agree. This is what we need to know. Help us get the information. We did. And you could not speak to someone at the council? No, no, we did. We went quite up. We, we, we went quite, quite, we, we worked, I mean, the, the record on it is, you know, the judge had the full record in front of her about what happened. And, you know, it's very unusual for a judge to write a judgment where she writes in her decision at trial after looking at the record, the taxpayers come before me with clean hands. She actually says that in her reasons. She didn't just make that up. The record was, um, was extremely um, was extremely compelling in terms of the efforts that were made. <laughs> to, to use your word, I like your word, the escalation was valiantly attempted. But if you ask me why I think this happened, is because we were in a pitch battle in the tax court on a assessment which was, or taxes, which were in the billions of dollars. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm just speculating, so in case somebody from CRA is listening, I'm just speculating. I don't know this to be a fact. But it's, some people felt that maybe they were attempting to use the interview process to essentially do a discovery that was already over, that there were holes in their discovery and they were not sure about things, but discovery process was over. We were headed to court and... How many days the discovery lasted? How many months uh, is, is what, it was months. Anyway, but the, 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 it, it, was, it was all seriously attempted. We did, we did not want to be before, uh, you know, we did not want to be before, we were too busy with the real issues to, we didn't want to go to court and fight about this, but we were forced to. Okay. Uh, uh, in your case, it was probably supported, not just by the auditor and his manager, it's probably Justice Canada that, that supported that action. Um, you, you know what? Obviously, because Justice Canada decided to take it to court, yeah. and there were discuss. You know, um, I, 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 I think I, I won't talk about specifically what happened because I don't want to comment about the file. But I can say this generally: that if your lawyers uh, do not take the time and sit down with Justice Justice to try and resolve this then they're not doing their job and and we were doing our job so you can infer that you know there were what what happened here i think what happened at the end of the day is they, they decided we were going to test this we we're going to test this provision to see if if we have this power in um, i know that sometimes yes the lawyers talk with justice and then sometimes justice wants to go to court but we've heard in our case where justice went back to the auditors and the auditors were pushing them to go to court. So, I mean, to me, that reflects to a certain extent bad faith on the auditors' part, on the CRA's part. Well, that, that's an interesting thing. I think the question about, you know, this always comes up, who's, who's making these decisions, who's pushing who around, and it all comes down to the individuals. Um, I mean, I'll say in my own example, when I worked at the Department of Justice, and I thought something was the right thing to do, there was no auditor that was going to tell me to do something I didn't want to do. It wasn't going to happen, right? I mean, the, the Department of Justice Act says that the administration of justice and litigation is within the purview of the Minister of Justice, not the CRA. So we all often talk about the CRA as being the client of the Department of Justice. Yes, it is as a practical matter. But if you have a strong, determined justice lawyer who believes something is right or wrong, they can, they can 
get it, you know, they can deal with it. But often you'll have, you know, personalities. You may have a very strong CRA person, strong senior CRA people, and Department of Justice lawyers who have a have an agnostic view of the matter. They go, you know, yeah, okay, if the CRA wants to go, we'll go. They don't have a they don't have a strong view on it. That's not a criticism of them because contrary to what most people think, there are lots of things that I don't have a strong view on. You know? So sometimes they say if the client really wants to pursue it, pursue it. So I think I think there's a the dynamic is different for every file. And where there's an interesting dynamic sometimes not so much as as it can be between justice and audit, but also within audit between audit and rulings, right, where audit's pushing a position and someone internal and internally there's some, you know, disagreement as to whether that position should be pushed, but ultimately it's audit has the authority to push an issue even though internally it's not actually supported. So we're actually past uh, 10 to 2, uh, so I'm going to zoom by some of the slides. Like I said earlier, you will get copies of it, so you'll be able to go back to it. But we do talk about like the practical considerations, like what you need to consider when whether to decide to agree or not with the interviews. Um, and, and we also uh, summarize what, what we can take from the majority decision of the Court of Appeal. Um, and, and I guess there's an open question uh, that has not been answered by that particular decision. Um, now for the uncertain tax position papers, well, I guess uh, Mark alluded to the fact that, uh, um, that there is a solution. You could always get those under the umbrella of solicitor client privilege, but obviously that has to be a legal opinion that is provided. Uh, a law firm cannot simply ask as a post office um, and and as, as Al mentioned, um, to me, it, it's, it's clear that we have not heard the last of this. Uh, Ted Gallivan, uh, senior CRA official, has mentioned time and time again that they were just looking to find the better case to bring back up to the federal court trial division. And he actually said at the APFF conference, uh, I believe it was two years ago, he said, we're going to find a case that we're sure to win, which obviously I'm not sure that exists, uh, but it, it, it is a matter that we're going to see. And, and, and obviously, as, as Al mentioned, you have a fact pattern in, in BP that is very particular. Um, and, and you can imagine a situation where the audit is ongoing, uh, where you do have questions that are not uh, answered to the satisfaction of, of the CRE, then what then? What happens? So that remains to be seen. Um, and, and we've covered the due diligence uh, reports. Uh, have you heard any uh, any requests from CRE in the Montreal area about uh, uncertain tax position? Or? Not me personally. I'm turning to my colleague, Mark. No, I haven't, haven't seen that particular request. But I think you can expect it, and you can expect due diligence reports and, and tax opinions to be requested, just assume it. Okay, so I guess in the next five minutes, uh, <laughs> we can talk about misrepresentation and gross negligence penalty. So one thing that, that, I, uh, that I want to point out is that the French version of the provision that deals with misrepresentation talks about misrepresentation of fact, whereas the English version does not. Um, I, I, there is some case law dealing with this, and to me it's, it's utterly un, unsatisfactory because they don't really address point blank the case. So, for instance, if you have a pure disagreement, both parties, the taxpayer and CRA, agree about the facts, but it's just a disagreement about how the law applies. Could this be misrepresentation? You do have case law that says that it, it does. You have other case law that says that, well, if, if it's just a disagreement about the application of the law, then uh, th there is no misrepresentation. So it's something to, uh, to think about. Um, that's the test that is applied for misrepresentation. Um, so care exercise must be that of a wise and prudent person, and the return must be filed in a manner that the taxpayer believes to, truly believes to be correct. Um, I'm going to skip by the, uh, the gross negligence penalty, and, and maybe we can talk about uh, 
uh, and I will ask uh, Mark to maybe give uh, an example uh, in two minutes <laughs> or less <laughs> of, of cases that we've seen where, where uh, those type of arguments have been raised. Well, as I uh, said at the outset, this is uh, very fertile ground. Revenue is, is raising these misrepresentation regularly. So you see on slide 34, we have situation one, taxpayers relied on professional advice that turns out to be wrong. So the, the issue here is there's a position taken in the return, revenue disagrees. Uh, whether that's a, we'll assume that that's a misrepresentation because the cases at least seem to suggest that the minute there's some position taken in return which is incorrect, that's a misrepresentation, although there's probably some evolution to be seen in the case law with respect to that issue. And so the, the question is, if you relied on legal advice or professional advice, is that sufficient to, uh, to, take, you out of the, uh, to take you out of the provision such that the normal reassessment period applies? And I think the point is we've seen situations where uh, where, where taxpayers have alleged professional advice, and then the question is, do you have to produce that professional advice? And, uh, and there may be reasons that you don't want to, it's for simply to preserve privilege or, um, uh, or, other, or other issues. So I, I would say to you that uh, be careful uh, in, in asserting this in, when you're in the context of litigation, because once you assert it, it could constitute a waiver of privilege. So there are some sensitivities around that, but relying on professional advice should itself be sufficient to provide a defense as long as that, uh, as the professional advice was contemporaneous and reasonable. Uh, second, situation two, uh, supposed misrepresentation is that the taxpayer did not predict the CRA's legal argument. I mean, you know, the, there's thinking people can disagree on issues and you could have a very reasonable position and, and land and end up being being ruled to be have, have taken the wrong position. Does that constitute a misrepresentation? Uh, as I said, I, I think that if you were reasonable in in arriving in that position, rather than sort of closing your eyes uh, or making your own or making your own um, your, your own evaluation of the law, I don't think that that uh, that that's sufficient to to get you out of the provision. Taxpayers made an honest mistake. Honest mistakes, uh, again, if you weren't, it, it, the standard should is whether the misrepresentation was due to neglect, carelessness, or willful default. So an honest mistake, uh, the example we were talking about is you have, uh, you've been assessed, you, have, you, you review your tax return, you reflect $10 million of income, uh, your actual income was, uh, was $11 million, say. Uh, you know, not identifying that error which might have been made by the tax preparer, for example, is, would seem to be an honest mistake. But if your income was actually $100 million and, you were, and you sign off on a tax return and there's $10 million, then obviously uh, that you, you were neglectful or you didn't take reasonable care in reviewing the return. And there's actually recent cases dealing with those, very, those precise examples. And then when it comes to penalties, it's the same issue, okay, where you have very sophisticated taxpayers who, uh, you know, fail to file returns uh, or have repeated errors, and they come forward and say, "Look, you know, the laws, you know, the, these these are innocent mistakes. How, how, you know, how could I have known?" And the courts will look at the background of the individuals. And in one case that comes to mind is the Melman case, where where this was a very sophisticated fund manager who was very sophisticated in financial matters. And he argued against, he had a very stiff gross negligence penalties uh, assessment against him. And the court had no sympathy for someone knowledgeable, uh, as knowledgeable as, as him, versus the innocent, you know, um, innocent taxpayer who, who's not sophisticated in, in, in tax matters and who innocently or is following the blind advice of their uh, tax preparer who may have been, who may be unscrupulous, for example, and leads them to make a mistake uh, in their tax return. In those cases, they may both be able to, they may, the taxpayer can avoid the opening of normal, the extension of the, of the assessment, reassessment period and uh, penalties. And with that, I'll yeah. stop. Mark, it's time to say goodbye. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody and ask you, because it's important that um,
that we that we uh, understand where we what we did right and what we did wrong. So, firstly, thank you uh, everyone who's attended in person. We appreciate you uh, participating in these and expressing your interest in these uh, continuing professional development events. We hope that you found this informative and enjoyable, hopefully practical, and with take take away take home value. Uh, if you could provide your comments, uh, this will help us to adjust for future uh, future events. So please take a moment and complete the feedback form that you have at your chair, and uh, we'll uh, we'll make the presentation available, as Louis said, to everyone who attended the seminar, and the certificates for the uh, bar uh, will be emailed to you. So again, thank you for your time and for attending today, and to everybody online. Thank you.